I was a caddy. I'd be angling to get on the bag of someone on live. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think you didn't hear I have yet to hear a guy that said his player from the PGA tour was going and he's, and he took a stand and <laughs> said, I'm not going with you. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by Underdog Fantasy. Code Mayo at Underdog Fantasy right now will get you a deposit match up to 100 bucks. So go do that and help out the show. Smash the like, sub to the channel while you are here because this is show one in a week full of players championship preview, the resource, the course preview. Plus we have caddy john rathouse on the line to break down the course and share some stories from the players championship with us and different guys that he's looped for over that time and maybe some uh, insight to some caddy player relationships currently going on so this is show number one we got stuff coming out for you all week sub to my newsletter that is the easiest place to track anything it is completely free you can find the link down in the description and if you didn't know as of yet two things one the pat mayo experience listeners league is back it is now on underdog we're doing major season best ball drafts it's already 30 percent full you can find that link on underdog under drafts under major season it's public so it's gonna fill super quick so if you're on the fence about getting in this is how you help out code mayo at underdog getting those drafts you can have up to six entries 25 dollars a piece and it lasts from masters all the way through the open championship you can check out the shows that i've done on it up on the network right now i'm super pumped i'm doing some live streams on the show doing drafts but if we fill this one quickly because it starts at the masters we fill quickly we'll get another and another bigger lower rank bigger buyouts payouts so i would say just go fill it up as quickly as possible code mayo at underdog right now and if you want a thousand dollars in underdog credits five of you will get that for the players championship with my new partnership for underdog fantasy go to the description right now there is a 15 second survey down there you fill up the 15 second survey you're in the draw to win one of the five one thousand dollar prizes so go do that i've now taken up too much of your time we got a ton of stuff coming out fantasynational.com slash mayo is where i will be doing my walkthrough at the end of this video you can always go through the time codes i go through the stats run the models but to bring him in right now john rathouse who has his own show which comes out monthly right now talking to caddies and talking through all the relationships on the pga tour but you've looped here a few times right yeah thanks for having me on pat yeah i was trying to think back like i feel like i've looped five or six players championships for about three different guys. So uh, it's always a fun week. I, I like that you have to think about like, it. would be funny. Like I can remember such vivid details of like bad beats that I've suffered, especially I mean, I've been such a gigantic loser at the players championship over like the, basically since Martin Keimer won the playoffs, I've been a loser really? at the players championship. And I think that was 2013. So it's uh, it's been a bad go for me at the players yeah. championship i just i can't figure out this course so i'm gonna try something different when we get to the research part but i really wanted to bring you in but i would remember everything maybe that's just my memory but it's a job when you're out there right yeah it's a job when you're out there um yeah, i think you kind of remember the really high highs and you remember the really low lows right and then as you go on over years i mean i started in 2004 uh, haven't been doing it as much lately, but like, yeah, they kind of, some of them bleed together. I think you and I were talking a little bit before. I think some of my, you know, favorite highlights over the years, certainly I remember the first time I ever did the caddy shot there on uh, Wednesday, which is just an absolute hilarious deal. Like, I mean, you have some really good players out there uh, that are caddies that hit some good shots and you have some really good caddies that are really bad players. I mean, I remember watching Steve Williams top one into the water my first go around there was a shank into the flower bed. Um, my highlight there was hitting the green a few years later. So, like, I hold that closely. Um, and, you know, uh, Seamus had a hole in one there uh, a few years back on on number four, which I think was the first ace ever there. That was a really cool deal the day before St. Patrick's Day. Um, you know, and I, I remember uh, being there for the pandemic one uh, more recently with Martin Laird and then uh, retrieving a putter uh, out of the – the, the ditch behind the fifth tee for John Merrick, probably, oh, I don't know, 12 years ago. Uh, the elephant man, John Merrick. What uh, what happened to his putter exactly? <laughs> he, you know, he, he three putted number four, which can be done. And he was so mad. And 
And he went, just chucked it into the tee box. I mean, you know, into the garden behind number five. And I, to this day, I wish I would have left it there to be quite honest. Um, but I went back and retrieved it, you know, like this kind of sometimes as a caddy, like that's your role. Uh, maybe could have drawn a line in the sand there, but he ended up having uh, a good season, maybe not a good players. So let's talk some strategy at this course and what we're looking for. We've seen a lot of crossover between Kapalua, weirdly enough, and maybe it's just mm. the top end players have always played Kapalua. Top end players tend to do well at Sawgrass, except like once every five years or so. Then you get your random, not that Webb Simpson's not a good player. Obviously, he's won a major championship, but he wins at 80 to 1. We've seen the middle to top of the board do really well at Sawgrass over the years, with Scotty being no exception. A year ago, he basically broke even putting. In fact, he may have even lost strokes putting last year and still won by like four or whatever it was. That's how good he was yeah. to Green and chipping everything in. But like Cam Smith ends up getting it done. We've seen Ricky Fowler end up getting it done at this course. So the big corollaries I would look at, Kapalua being one, but the biggest one that sticks out in my mind is the Wyndham Championship. Webb has won both of those. Stenson has won both both of those there's like five people see Wu has won both of those so like now when we're getting into some of these shorter type players that aren't the actual superstars on the pga tour these are the guys that have won both Wyndham and won at the players championship have you caddied at all at sedgefield before oh yeah get it sedgefield i was there with uh steven yeager two years ago he shot 62 on sunday which was only one stroke worse than tom kim shooting 61 uh that year that he won so uh, I, that corollary makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think when you think about it, uh, you know, the players, you, you're dialing it back off the tee in a lot of places, a lot of instances. Uh, that's what happens at Sedgefield. Um, and you got to be a good iron player. Um, it just really rewards it. When you talk about Scotty Scheffler, like top tier player, tee to green game on fire, saving himself with the short game too. Like that's that's what you want there. But then it also opens up, for these guys that are like below tier number one and, you know, guys that are in good form or guys that are, have always been good iron players that can find the fairway off the tee. And now you don't have major championship pressure, right? Like you're like, Hey, I can go ahead and win the players championship. I'm not going to think about the U S open, you know, cause these guys, they look up and down the range, they size people up and, and you know, we're all humans. And so I think that's a little bit of a factor here where you see some of those middle longer odd guys, that they can get it done here. Yeah, and in I guess because you when you take out cuz the, the way that I always try to break it down, I'll see if you agree with this is that you know, in any given day, Scotty Scheffler can lead the field in putting. That can happen. It's not likely to happen just based on what we've seen from him over the course of the past 18 months or so, but it can happen. There is no way that Brant Snedeker is going to be in this field and outdrive Scotty Scheffler. It's just not going right. to happen. But right. at Sawgrass, that could be equalized, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think certainly could could do it off the tee, right? But then now yeah. can you, can you, the iron game, is that going to be present? And you could have a hot week with your irons. You could be coming in with some really good form and, like, above your your baseline, and that could translate over, you know, especially if you're a winner on tour. Um, you know, but, you know, you I think you have to have the iron game to complement it too because it sets up the putting out there. And I know that's just, like, seems like a really, you know, nor easy thing to talk about. Like, it's like, yeah, duh. Well, I mean, the greens out there, like if you get them in the right sections, they're not terribly difficult. Now, if you start getting in the wrong sections or you get short sided, you've got major problems. And and so that's where the consistency and, and, you know, the top the top echelon iron play gets rewarded. Yeah. So I, I guess my point was more that the shorter players seem to be at le have less of a disadvantage here uh, totally. versus Riviera or Torrey Pines or a place like that. Totally. No, you're absolutely right. Because, yeah, you're not having to hit driver as much. Or if a guy, you know, Sky Shepard's going to hit three wood, Brant can hit driver, right? So, yeah, it, it that's a totally, you know, it's a plotter's golf course, right? I mean, I think that's, you know, we hear that narrative a lot, too. It's like you got to play this Pete Dye course, you know, to the corner of the dog legs. You got to know when you can press it up. And most oftentimes, the answer is no. We're going to all play to the same area. So do you think that benefits, so when you guys are out scouting the course, so when you're doing your walkthrough in the round before, like, is that what you're looking for? It's like, oh, if I get it to this spot on the par five, this is go time. If I don't, like, it doesn't matter how good the wind is, whatever's going on, like, you have to have the fortitude to say, I am laying up here and not making a huge number. Yeah, and I think that's where the analytics these days can come in, you know, handy. And all these guys have an analytics team too. And so, like, if you combine that data that you're getting, 
with your caddy instinct and kind of where you know your players' strengths are too, like you can definitely formulate a plan. This is a place where you, you see more caddies with their heads in their pin sheets this week. You see more caddies walking the golf course than normal this week. You you have to be on your game, so to speak, you know, as a caddy as well uh, with, with it this week to, to really contend and, and play well. I was trying to think back uh, the year that Jason Day won the Players Championship. Were you there that year? I can't remember what year it was. Boy, it was the, uh, it was it was the year where the Saturday like, was impossible. Yeah, I don't think I don't think I was there. I don't think I was there that year. Yeah, it was the. I, I think Ken Duke was like five oh. under on a Saturday, and like everyone else yes. was eighty. <laughs> it was like, yes. well, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Man, Ken Duke, the ultimate showman. That guy, I miss that guy. Yeah, I don't. I wasn't there for that, but you can see right the bad weather things can come in too, uh, especially now playing it in March. I don't know when that was that Jason was there, but you know this March. I was looking at the weather forecast, and it looks pretty good for next week. You know, I mean, we'll see here for this week. You know, the the, the uh, it looks like it's you know 60s and up into 80s and the wind out of the south. So like, I think it's going to be a nice week of weather for the guys to kind of attack this place a little bit. Yeah, I got it. Me uh, me and Tambo got it way wrong the year that Justin Thomas ended up winning because we stacked one side of the wave thinking like, oh, my, like just to look at the forecast. It's like, oh my God, mm -hmm. there's so much wind in the afternoon on Thursday and it translates into Friday morning. I'll just play the guys and I'll bet the guys that are early on Thursday and late on Friday. This is perfect. Right. We're going to, and everyone kind of did. I think 7% of the field on DraftKings ended up going that way and 1% went the other way. And all that happened was there was a bit of rain, there was a delay, and then all of the guys that I picked ended up in just the worst <laughs> weather for like two and a half days because that was the one that went on and on and on and on and on. Yeah. And then uh, it ended up coming down to Justin Thomas battling out of that terrible way. Maybe it was, was it Justin Thomas who won? Now I can't even remember. It may have been Cam Smith who won. Just trying to oh. run these all through my mind. Maybe Cam Smith. Well, Cam, yeah, Cam Smith, that was, the, Cam Smith was the bad weather one because I remember he was like able to just camp out at his house the whole week, right? And That's he, like, right. Got a good draw and he lived like 15 minutes from the golf course. And I mean, of course, you just remember it's just another bad players championship for me. Yeah. I mean, that happens. So do you think <laughs> Jagger actually has a, like, I don't want to say like a chance to win? Obviously, he has a chance to win. He's in the field. But yep. is this, does this course set up well for him? I mean, I think so. Like, I think he's got a, I think he's got a, I think he'd be a nice placement bet, you know, because I think you see the guys that are playing well rise to the top in these weeks because they come in with confidence. And, you know, Steve, Steven made a great caddy hire. He'd been just kind of not having a full-time guy forever. And he, he, he hired Henry Diana in the off season who had a lot of success, you know, with Tom Hoagie when he won at Pebble uh, with Charles Howell the third for all these years, He's very stable veteran caddy, great uh, green reader as well. And they've had some nice results this year. So, yeah, I think I think Jaeger sets up well uh, in that sense this week to be, you know, certainly, you know, you look at his odds on a top 10 bet and stuff. And, you know, if you want to throw a little small money on a, on a possible win, like, you know, why not? He's won on, you know, on, on the Corn Ferry Tour a lot. This would be a big one for him to break through first time win on the PGA Tour, but he's playing well. That that's happened before. Like I remember, this was sort of like Kuchar's big win, and really kind of stood up as the big win of his career. Like breaking onto the scene. This is where Sergio got it done. This is where Adam Scott got it done. Super young. I think this was the biggest win of Stephen Ames's career. Did right. Stephen Ames win this? I feel like Stephen. Yes. Yeah. He did. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just looking at the Wyndham Championship right now. So to close that Wyndham Championship loop, Kisner won the Wyndham. He lost in a playoff uh, to Ricky and Sergio at the Players' yeah. Championship. But other than that, we have Stenson won both, Siwoo won both, Davis Love has won both, Sergio has won both, Webb has won both, and that's just from the past 12 years. Okay, and so let me throw this one at you that I was kind of wanted to highlight anyways. One of the past winners that we mentioned earlier this episode is Tom Kim. Who, who is on Tom Kim's bag now? Paul Tesori. Paul Tesori uh, is a member at Sawgrass. Paul Tesori was on the bag there for, uh, you know, for that win with uh, Webb Simpson. I mean, you know, so that, that'll be an interesting one. I think they, they've had an, one maybe good tournament so far. Um, Tom's form hasn't been great, but I would certainly put a little star next to Tom Kim this week, kind of see how, he, how he's looking early on the week because he's got the guy in the bag that can guide him around. So far with Tom Kim, uh, I mean, he had a really bad, I guess, Sunday slash Monday 
at the former Honda, the now the Cognizant Classic. But his irons <laughs> have been fine. Like, and he's hitting every single fairway. Like, that's why you would like Tom Kim here because yeah. he's one of the few guys. Like, I always thought Morikawa would be way better at Sawgrass than he's been yeah. because he can hit driver and hit every fairway anyway. So he's never losing anything off the tee. Um, I guess it's just, you know, the putting. And sometimes, you know, you make one bad shot, you're in the water. That's the one thing about the stat analysis. That's why I'm, I really wanted to talk to you about this because I can run all the models I want. I find the Florida swing is notoriously not good for stat modeling because I remember Paul Casey had like never missed a cut at the players that he put two in the water on 17 and he was like plus 12 or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. The wind is so much more volatile. The weather is more volatile around there. And then you have uh, a lot more water op opportunities to hit the ball in the water. And those are there out at the players, big numbers. Like you have to avoid double bogeys and you know, guys that are a little shaky mentally, you know, can, can find their way into the water and, and then just wrecks your scorecard quickly. Yeah, the other thing, I mean, with Tom Kim, the irons have been good. He's deadly accurate off the tee. It's just his putting has been atrocious. So maybe Tesori can help him with that here. Yes. I, I mean, I'm sure Tom's what he, he's going to be way down the odds boards from what people might like. He's going to have value, right? I would think. Uh, he keeps coming in at like 35, 40 to one, but, mm -hmm he keeps sucking so and no one's yeah. betting him so if we can get right. him at like i don't want to say 50 would be like right around the threshold where i would start thinking about it but mm -hmm. you know if no one is betting him at 50 all of a sudden 60 75 80 mm -hmm. now we're in that the web simpson range basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah another one that's that was just uh interesting to me was that was part of that whole switch over was uh joe scoverin going over to uh Aubert. And they haven't gotten off to the greatest of starts, but I would think that this golf course would set up really well for him. Um, and then obviously Joe was on the bag when Ricky won. He's got a lot of experience around here uh, as well. So I, I don't know quite what O'Bear's form is going into this, but he seems like a guy that going to hit a lot of fairways, going to hit a lot of greens, you know, has the balls to get it done. If he gets in the mix, maybe still a little young. So that's an interesting one. Well, the issue I've had with uh, Ludwig so far is that his wedges are absolutely terrible. Like, mm -hmm. versus the very high-end players. Like, you know, if you could just somehow paste Brendan Todd's wedge game onto Ludwig, he'd be the number one player in the world right now, uh, even after, like, nine months or something like that. Right. But it's interesting to see where he has done well, because you would think, like, like I bet him to win at Bay Hill. Um, Bay Hill has not concluded. I don't think that he's going to win <laughs> after seeing a little bit of what I've seen so far. However, yeah. second at Pebble Beach, super short course. He won the RSM Classic. Those are not long courses whatsoever. Like, short mm -hmm. Bermuda-type courses. John Deere, fourth place. It's funny that we see this sometimes with certain guys. Like, Woodland was like this where almost all of his best finishes in his career have come at shorter courses versus long courses. Although, in our minds, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. he bombs it. Of course he's going to be great at long courses. He's not. And all of a sudden, he plays really well at the shorter courses. Uh, another mm -hmm. guy like that is Taylor Pendrith, who tends to play really well at the shorter courses versus the longer courses, despite the fact that he averages like 320 off the tee. Like, I don't... Do you ever really like why? Is it a mental thing or is it just... I, yeah, I, don't I, mean, get I, think, I mean, some of it could be there. You're looking at like uh, strength of field, um, you know, and that could be a little bit of a factor. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like that's interesting with Ludwig with like, you talk about uh, Pebble Beach and there's like tons of short irons out there. And you're saying statistically like, man, it doesn't look like he he is, you know, up to snuff in that right now. Yet he goes out and plays well. So, um, yeah, some of it is just like, you know, it's like that thing where the player says, you know, I show up there that week and I just feel good. Like that's that place just fits me for whatever reason. I can't explain it either. Right. It's a little asterisk next to it. It just strikes me as odd that these bombers would play well at the shorter courses. Maybe it's because they can dial back off the tee, even though it's such a weapon for all of them that there's just something in their minds that they're just more comfortable hitting irons off the tee or something. Sure, yeah, I think that's probably a factor. I'd be interested to see, like, if they play the par fives even better than usual, too, you know, because they have an advantage coming into the green there. Maybe they make, you know, more birdies or a couple more eagles throughout the week, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, th this is where digging in even more. Someone brought it up. Uh, yesterday, I think it was Justin Ray on Twitter, kind of talked about, or it may, it may have actually been Stephen Hennessy or Chris Powers. I don't want to misattribute who it was. It was one of those three, I think, that Victor... Uh, was really mad about one of the shots that he hit on a par three and ended up rolling to like five feet or something like that. And people are like, how can you be so mad? We see it with Hideki all the time <laughs> too, is that we're charting strokes gained on shots, hole by hole. We can try to figure that part out. But the point that they were making was Victor has a spot 
that he is trying to hit. And the reason that, that he's mad isn't that he hit a really great shot, which he did. It's that he missed the spot that he was aiming at by so much and ended up getting lucky that these players are now actually having, like you mentioned, their own analytics teams and they're tracking their own strokes gained from where their actual targets are versus what the results are. Have you been hearing this? Yeah, that's absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, I think that's been a thing on tour forever, but like now you've got this extra component that you can factor in and maybe like, uh, you know, Matt Every was on uh, uh, Eyes on Golf podcast for this week talking about Bay Hill. And I mean, he had a great, great answer uh, about how he approached Sunday where he's like, I'm not a data guy at all. And I ran into Hortsey in the locker room and he said, you're too brat, you know, you're too uh, aggressive on Sundays. I'm going to give you this blueprint to dial it back and be more conservative. And what he did, he went out and won. So like, you know, there is something to that. I think, you know, some of the reactions you're seeing too, though, uh, harder to tell like where maybe contact isn't what somebody wanted. Right. And then obviously these guys have this, you know, barometer that's greater than the average golfer. And so it's all relative to there on, on some of those, you, you never quite know what those reactions are for, but certainly hitting your spots is, is a big deal out there. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, Oberg, Tom Kim, new caddies on the bag. Uh, both caddies have caddied for previous players' championship winners. What are some of the other new pairings that you find interesting right now? Yeah, so other one that just kind of like went into this week, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you think about Sung Jay right now. Um, you know, Will Wilcox jumped on his bag and they really got off to a good start. And, and you know, I have been hearing some things that, Sung Jay kind of struggling with hitting the ball both ways. And I think that shows itself in its results. Uh, Will did have that ace on number 17 years ago when he was playing. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing. So the, the what I wanted to ask you, is it just me or does Sung Jay look 20 pounds lighter? Oh, really? He, he like, yeah, he just, he looked, his body looks different. Like he always looked kind of like portly when he was out <laughs> there and he looks like svelte now. And I yeah. remember... This must have been 10 years ago. The Swedish porn mm -hmm. king, Carl Peterson, he <laughs> lost like 50 pounds one like off season. And he right. sucked oh. when he came back. And he's like, right. I, I don't have my swing anymore. He's like, my, mm -hmm. I, my entire life I've been this size. Mm -hmm. I know how to swing with one body type. He's like, he, he basically just said he ate ice cream for two months and gained the weight back <laughs> so he could play again. To get it back. Yeah, interesting. Maybe Sungjae's hitting the gym too hard. You know, he's got a big head still. Um, it, it, it's a fucking bucket man <laughs> absolutely massive so yeah I, I don't know what's up with Sungjae right now but will's on the bag and i like will on the bag for him i think i think that's gonna stick around uh you know i've been i, I ran into joe lacava uh, who i had on the first episode of my podcast this season and i saw him out in uh, at riviera and obviously he's with patrick cantley now and they've had some really good finishes they have yet to close the door i thought they would get it done on the west coast swing it didn't quite happen um i like that that grouping it's a little bit different for patrick than maybe uh what he's had in the past him and revy were really good together but that's an interesting one to keep an eye on uh for this week as well well um can patrick cantlay and joe run into the guy that gave matt every the sunday blueprint and have him do up a sunday blueprint for patrick cantlay so we can actually win a tournament on sunday <laughs> okay yeah that's a fair point that's a fair point i mean i don't know if if uh, Patrick has a data team, you know, I'd be interested to find that out. But um, yeah, Sundays, it's hard to win golf tournaments on the PGA Tour. Oh, for sure. And listen, you're you're a loser who can't close until you close. And then you're the guy right. who who always wins. Like it just it yeah. just takes one, and then all of a sudden yeah. people people forget the narrative that they've built in their minds about you. Sure. Like, like imagine, and it's so much that Tiger ruined this for everyone that he won so much that it became this like, and it's, it's a once in every 40 years type player that right. comes through that it's like, yeah, guys don't win at this rate. Think, I, I always thought about this. And obviously Jack has the most, he has 18, but I think he has like 40 second place finishes or 40 top three finishes in majors. Yeah. And that record gets held up like, oh my God, this guy has been amazing in major championships year over year. And although he won 18 of them, if it was in today's day and age with the discourse that we have now, he would be kind of branded a loser because he didn't have more majors. That's how this would work. For sure. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And, you know, I mean, it makes me think of Brooks Kepka a little bit, right? Rory. Like Brooks kind of talks about how, you know, he's like, hey, when I show up, I know that, you know, two thirds of these guys, three quarters of them don't even have a chance. So I'm not even worried about them. I'm just going to worry about myself and, and we'll see where it falls this week if I have what it takes, you know, and I'm going to go for it. 
you know, and maybe I might reflect afterwards and be like, man, I wish I would have played that hole a little differently or, or whatever. And that's what cost me in the end. Um, so that's interesting. Another one about Tiger that I, I find interesting. I don't know if, you know, you talk about the same topic, like, I, do you remember ever before, you know, Tiger, like after Tiger was in this prime, like, and he always has this statement. He's like, what are you trying to do this week? Well, I'm just trying to get into contention on the back nine on Sunday. Right. And he says that out loud. And now every player says, I'm just trying to get into contention on the back. Like, I don't think guys ever used to say that they might've thought it, but I never used to hear that said. And now every single player says that. And obviously they look up to tiger. I just find that interesting that like that, that's the goal, you know, to, to get into contention on the back nine on Sunday. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it, 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 Tiger has to readjust what his statement's going to be when he's guy who wins every <laughs> tournament to guy yeah. has traumatic back injury can barely walk yet is still somehow one of the best players in the world at the time that you're talking about it but like winning's hard just think about yeah. how many major championships tiger actually had a chance to win b between him winning the masters in 19 and then him winning the u.s open in 2008 like he was in contention mm -hmm. like 10 of those didn't win any yeah, yeah for sure yeah the unbelievable record and, and i'm curious to see if he's going to be teeing it up this week Ooh. I mean, if he's not, do you, I mean, we don't know. He said he was sick at Riviera. He didn't mm -hmm. look physically bad. Like, he mm -hmm. didn't look like he was, like, playing well. Obviously, he yeah. shanked a shot, which yeah. I never thought would happen in my <laughs> entire life. But if it truly just yeah. was the flu, I don't see why he wouldn't play. Yeah, yeah bad in and out. We got a lot of guys that week. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think, yeah, I'd like to, to, to keep an eye on that. You know, like, I mean, obviously, it's it's nice when he's playing, and, and you would think that, the players will be a good fit for him. He obviously just needs more reps, like, in a, and we're not going to get a lot of them. So it's just a tricky situation. Yeah. I mean, especially where we're with golf sat right now, like the more tiger that they can have on the TV screens, the better it's going to be for the ratings, better it's going to be for mm -hmm. the general interest in a lot of this stuff. Just, I mean, even the Riviera ratings were through the roof just because tiger was stumbling around the course. But <laughs> I, I do think that, like trying to, it's funny that he won the Masters in 2019 only because it's the hilliest golf course. You think it would be the worst for him, and we saw him get it got the best of him last year. Like he just physically right. couldn't do Augusta, but the player seems like perfect. Yeah, nice flat walk on the beach. Yeah, for and, sure. And if he ever has a chance to win a major championship again, I, I would say 98 percent it has to come at the Open Championship. Yeah, yeah. Which like, where Tom Watson still we still she should have won that tournament. Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel bad for Stuart Sink, though, because everyone was rooting against him. And, like, he got his major. Like, Stuart Sink, you know, he's been yeah. playing for 35 years. He finally, break, like, it's such a great journeyman story, wins mm -hmm. a major championship. And everyone's like, fuck this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his caddy, Frank's, told me some stories about that week. And uh, and Frank's out caddy this week in Puerto Rico. Uh, good to see him coming off the bench. So, yeah, I mean, you never know what's going to happen. It's 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 crazy. That's why we love this, right? Yeah. yeah. Any uh, player caddy stuff that maybe not – like, is, is how's Cam Young doing with the new caddy? Like, how are these new caddies, like, evolving into it? And, like, do you find that some of them just might not be good pairs? Like, we haven't seen any results. Yeah, Cam Young. Yeah, he he's kind of gone through a few since he had Paul Tesori on the bag, you know. And I don't know Cam very well. I, I do feel like he – he gave his original caddy the boot way too early. I was I was really disappointed. That kid was a nice kid. They were doing well in the majors, and someone got in his ear and said, "You need somebody that's seen this, done that." And that's sometimes that's bullshit. Like you need to just kind of grow together. I had the opportunity to do that with John Merrick, and you know I was thankful for that. I'm sure he was getting business cards in his locker room, you know. And I, and I got a chance to stick around with him, grow with him. We had some nice years out there. Um, so I feel like Cam kind of booted his buddy too early and it's kind of screwed with his mojo um he's got steve underwood on the bag now who's a very experienced caddy had a nice run back in the day with uh tim clark how about that name paul like steve's uh, Play, has players champion tim clark there you go so yeah cam young i they have had some better finishes here lately since steve got on the bag there's been a little stability there uh which is nice to see but um yeah you never know what the right mix is going to be and and you see a lot of uh you know jockeying there's not as much you know like this you know this week at bay hill or you know there's like f four or five new ones you know so like it's you know usually with your guy but um and, and it's some of it is for me pat these days like i don't know as some of the guys like i didn't you know there's newer newer blood coming out there now new caddies and stuff and and i haven't been out there as much frequently in, in recent years so I, some of the, the guys i don't know as well but well 
you can have them on your show. Plug the show. Tell everyone where they can find it. Yeah, quiet, please. Uh, you know, wherever you get podcasts, I'm with uh, Herd at Sports here in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, like I said, we had Joe LaCava on to start this year. Uh, Troy Martin, who you've had on your show, fellow uh, Nebraskan, uh, who was out there with Steve Alker doing well. And then I'm going to get uh, Gary Matthews, Joaquin Neiman's caddy, on the bag here before the Masters. So that should be a good episode. And then uh, just on my social media, mostly on Twitter, uh, at Rat House, I've got those player caddy teams that come out every week. I like to put a little one minute video together and post the teams and uh, maybe highlight a few of the changes for the week. So if anybody wants to factor that into their betting or if they just want to follow along for fun. Let me ask you about like live for, do you, because th- I've been trying to come up with my own rankings, like my own world golf rankings. Yeah. How do you rate the live guys? Like, are they all really, really good? Cause they just beat the same 10 guys every single week. <laughs> yeah i mean it's top heavy out there and you don't you can't the courses don't seem as difficult um the 54 holes throws things off i mean i think i think those guys that are still getting to play in the major championships and those and they're also not too far removed from their time on the pga tour so we can kind of like you know give them you know the benefit of the doubt on you know well did they show us stuff when they were out on the pga tour so i think you can come together with like a decent raking but like the further this goes and these guys are plummeting down the world rankings when they win, like the more it doesn't make sense. Um, so, you know, a guy like Joaquin Neiman, like the way he's playing right now, he's a top 10 player in the world and he should be one of the favorites at Augusta, but he's ranked number 75. See, th- this is where I have the problem in ranking someone like Neiman. So Neiman's a top 10 player in the world, but would you have him ranked above Brooks? No, I Brooks is a top nine player in the world. Okay, would you have him ranked above DJ? Yes. I mean, DJ just won and live. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe Joaquin's the top 15, top, top 20 player in the world. But you could um, even spin it like he's a top five guy, too, just based right, on yeah, one, like the role that he's been on. Like, it's kind of yeah. like Louis has been. Louis won twice on yeah. DP in South Africa, and then he's been, like, top five of every live event so far. Like, But he didn't get an invitation to the Masters. Like, it's right. so hard to judge how these guys are doing because the only time that we don't see them outside, like, in the majors, then we know. And, like, Brooks right. kind of proved his medal last year. It's like, oh, yeah, he's still, like, the the Terminator when it comes down to major championships. Yeah. He can still get his game up there. So that yeah. helps, I think, what the perception of Liv is, is that, oh, yeah, they do have the guys that are still coming out. It's not like they're going to play exhibition events and they don't care about golf anymore. No, yeah. these guys can be killers when they still need to be killers. But outside of the majors, you just see them play against the same 54 or 48 guys every yeah. time. Or they're playing against a bunch of Asian tour dudes in <laughs> Oman or in South Africa. Right. It's like, yeah I, yeah, I would expect Louis to beat these bums. Sure. Sure. It's nice seeing Louis playing well again. And these guys, ha- I, I respect the guys that are going outside of the live schedule and playing some, uh, you know, and I think that gives them, you know, a little bit of stuff to take into these major championships. Um, we'll see how it all gets sorted out. I mean, uh, there are some really top world-class players out on that tour, no doubt. And I think they probably are fe- feeling it. When they come into these major championships, the guys are getting the opportunities this year. Uh, did you have any friends that caddied that went over to live? Oh, yeah. I, I, there's a lot of people I know over there that are caddying. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, and, and t- I haven't talked to them as much recently. Uh, that's why I'm kind of interested to get Gary on the show. And I, hopefully he'll come on because I feel like some of them have been kind of like, hey, we're just not going to talk about this. And, you know, they're out there doing their thing. I think it very much seems like a family um, you know, I think they're out there enjoying themselves and, and, and competing. I think they are working at their craft. I just think that the guarantees that are part of it, um, it's hard to judge, you know, how those are factoring in kind of their overall state of their personal games. Now, then how do you evaluate that guy when he comes over and plays in a major championship, a Dustin Johnson, more so than a Joaquin Neiman. Like I kind of know what I'm getting with Joaquin. Like he's motivated. He said it, he's ready to go. Like, DJ, that's one where you're a little bit more like, hmm, is he on the back end? And with DJ, I mean, DJ 10 years ago, it felt like the same. Right. Like, Does he even really care about this? And then he would just win anyway. Yeah. So that's how right. good DJ is and probably still is. But with the, like with your buddies that are over there and the caddies that are there, so did they get cut in on the guarantee? Like, did they get their cut of the guaranteed money or is it like a different pay structure than it would be on the PGA Tour week to week? Um, no, I think the pay structure is probably the same. I think that, you know, what Liv was doing initially was kind of paying their way, which kind of made it even sweeter. Uh, and so, but I think they've kind of gotten away from that model a little bit. They're, they're, they don't want to burn through that much cash. 
Um, but I think, you know, the guys out there are probably making those, you know, same 10% and their weekly salary is probably pretty nice. And, and, you know, 10% of 4 million is like 400 grand. Like that's, that's a really nice week's work. Like those guys that are out there are, are doing really well. Yeah. It seems to be, I would be, if, if it was me and I was a caddy, I'd be angling to get on the bag of someone on live. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think you didn't hear I have yet to hear a guy that said his player from the PGA tour was going and he's, and he took a stand and said, <laughs> I'm not going with you. <laughs> I haven't right. heard of that. Yet. All right, John, thanks for coming on. We'll have to get your insights on some of the courses coming up soon. And you know, you still have all your friends out there. If you want to pass them along my way so we can get sure. some more in-depth knowledge about the course, course knowledge and what we should be looking for, for some of these events, I am more than open for it. I know that the viewers will really appreciate that. Well, once again, tell everyone where they can sub to your pod and follow you on Twitter. Yeah, at Rathouse, R-A-T-H-O-U-Z, and then Quiet Please podcast. And yeah, I'll send some guys your way. It's always fun talking with you, Pat. And I hope that I can get out there a couple times this year. Maybe you'll see me on a bag uh, on a TV screen near you. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Steven Yeager, Wyndham Championship. We'll all bet it. He can win. And then we'll all, we'll all, <laughs> we'll all prosper. We'll all retire. Yeah. It'll be perfect. Uh, that's thanks. John Rathouse. You can catch him at all of the places where he mentions it. Go follow him on Twitter right now. It's time for me to dig into fantasynational.com and get into the statistical research. Stay tuned. Okay, let's talk about TPC Sawgrass, the quote-unquote fifth major, which for a time, I suppose you guess, I guess you could have called it the fifth major because it was probably the strongest field of the year, but without the live guys, who obviously are not in PGA Tours flagship event, and Tiger Woods not playing, then it's just all the regulars that you would expect. There's 144 players in the field, top 65 in ties after 36 holes, make the cut. Scotty Scheffler is the defending champion, and it is of note that... They made all these concessions to try to keep up with Liv and have these signature events where we're going to get the best of the best together because we need to showcase to everyone out there what the best players can do. So take this week at the Arnold Palmer Invitational, for example. 69 players, a cut of top 50 in ties. That doesn't sound really like a real tournament. That sounds more like a Liv tournament than anything else. Yet, when they actually have their flagship event, it is a completely full field, which is exactly what people want to see. It's so stupid. Anyway, Sawgrass is fun. I've really come around on this tournament over the years, and when I start doing this walkthrough, which you can always go to at fantasynational.com slash mayo to do your own walkthrough or follow along with me, find the things that you want. That code will get you 20% off, and hopefully we have a nice bonus coming for you in the next month or so if you are a member at Fantasy National. We have a brand new filter as well, which I'll showcase here in a second. I just am so bad. At this tournament, I hit Martin Keimer to win here at 80 to 1 like 10 years ago, and I think I've lost every other cent I've ever put into this tournament after that. It's been like last year, the only thing that were profitable for me were like the top 40 and top 30 markets with some guys that I was on. I just don't have a grasp on who ends up doing well here. And I'll release my column on Monday uh, for free in my newsletter. If you subscribe to the newsletter down in the description right now or go to Mayo Media Substack, you can get that sent directly to you. And I have sort of a breakdown on from a DraftKings perspective, at least like how the higher owned players do at this tournament. Basically, I'm coming up with a new approach this year. And my approach is just going to be, I kind of know what works at this tournament, yet I never take my own advice on it. And we'll do that when we go through the walkthrough. I do want to talk about the course a little bit. Sawgrass, you know it, you see it on TV every single year. This is the 50th year of the Players' Championship, 7,189 yards par 72. And here's the big difference this year. They are calling the Greens POA. Their POA trivials overseeded, and every year before this, it's been Tiff Eagle, Bermuda Grass overseeded with the POA, so it would always be in like, oh, it's Bermuda, it's Bermuda, it's Bermuda. No, it's actually POA. It's a lot like what we see in Phoenix and what we see at the American Express, just dormant at the, the Bermuda's just dormant this time of year, so it's POA on top of everything. So, I mean, Scotty wins in Phoenix. We've seen a lot of Phoenix crossover at this course over the years. Uh, so maybe the, there is something to do with that. A lot of chippings at these courses as well. There is water in play on every single hole. And that's really where it kind of gets me down. That you can't even look at course history at the Players' Championship because there really is none. And we take a look at the former champions, how they did in previous years. 
nothing really points to it. It's like, oh yeah, this guy was close for years, and then he finally broke through at Sawgrass. No, it doesn't really work like that. It's all recent form coming into this tournament. The average green size is 5,500 yards. There's 90, or sorry, there's 88, no, no, sorry, 92 bunkers across. That's up from 88 uh, two years ago, so they, they've added a few more, like, little ones along the way. There was a bit of a redesign in 2016. Uh, they really changed hole number 12, uh, and it's technically a drivable par four right now, although it's not really. It's not like drivable in the sense that you might make eagle. It has a 0.4% eagle rate, so I, I'm not too concerned about guys making eagle on number 12. Just don't go into the water left. Just just lay it up and try to make birdie. It's probably the easiest way to go about things. The worst thing you can do in a lot of times, depending on the pin position on number 12, is miss to the right, and then you have that chip up to an elevated green that slopes towards the water. So if, if you don't have any spin coming out of the rough, if you end up in the rough, or if you just have a terrible lie in the bunker and you can't generate enough spin, you might just roll it in. So being conservative on that hole has generally been the thing. And that's the thing about this course. And I talked about it with John. And Bryson was the best example of this the year that... Who the hell won that year? I think it was Justin Thomas. Bryson ended up coming like third. Yeah, I think that's what it was. In 2021, yeah, Bryson basically just did, took iron off every tee. That negates the biggest weapon he had at the time, was just bombing it. That was the week after he tried to drive the par 5 at the Arnold Palmer Invitational uh, and was just mashing it, 280 or 380 off the tee every single time. He's like, look, you can make birdies at this course. The thing that you can't do at this course is make a triple. I mean, you can do that pretty easily. You can make a quintuple bogey here with the amount of water that's around but just taking a conservative approach keeping it in the fairway aiming at the right levels on the green because john said that once you're on the right level of the green these are not tricky greens to figure out now if you get yourself out of position in the wrong quadrant of the green or on the wrong tier then you got some issues to deal with so if you can just get to your number play as conservative as possible and just hope that the putts go down that's how you win this tournament or you can just be like scheffler last year and hit everything to like three feet and chip in eight times and you don't even need about well then you can win overall the par threes at this course have an average distance of 138 yards um and it's 183 yards sorry there's one really long one number eight that's 237 yards that is the third most difficult hole on the course the shortest one is 137 that's actually the sixth most difficult hole on the course all of the par fours play over par but number eight has a 25 percent bogey rate that is the third highest on the course Scheffler won last year he had 11 birdies on his card before he birdied a par three he made birdie at number eight on Saturday so just tread your water just don't make big numbers on the par threes go on your way you need to beat up on the par fives score on the easy par fours and push everywhere else that is the game plan this week the two toughest holes on the course are par fours on the back nine, 14, and the closing hole, 18. The only two holes with a bogey rate over 25%. They also have a double or worse rate of over 4% too. So a one-stroke, two-stroke lead going into the 72nd hole might not hold up. It usually does, but it might not. Hatton hit maybe the best shot I've ever seen on 18 last year. It was just incredible to see the way that he ended up attacking that from where he was. It just played that huge cut. It was awesome. He ended up coming in second, but everyone just got destroyed by Scheffler. The par fives, uh, 554 yards is the average distance for the five easiest holes on the course. I mean, that's what you're going to find with most of the par fives. Uh, they all play below par and, you know, the finishing position of the top four SG strokes gain in par five last season finished first, third, fifth, and 19th. And four of the five easiest holes in terms of birdie rate or better uh, are here as well. When you take a look at it, uh, the more difficult one is the 602 yard number nine par five that it, it does have a birdie rate of 30%. That's nothing to sneeze at a par rate of 55%, but a bogey rate of 13%. Very few Eagles generated. The Eagles really come at two and 16, a 3.4 Eagle percentage and a 2% uh, Eagle percentage on those 2% on number 11 as well. They're all kind of gettable by most of the field, but this is the, these are really the only holes and 18 too, if you can hit like a very nice draw into wherever you need to go to make sure that you don't end up in that pine straw 
or don't end up in the left water. Play that the, the year that Justin Thomas won, and he played that like low burner that almost went into the water, but didn't go into the water. Just stayed up enough for him to get it. That's sort of like the ideal shot on that hole. It was very difficult. Like the cut sweats are going to be fun this week. We're doing a cut sweat show on Friday afternoon, weather pending, and. God forbid the weather actually looks like okay in terms of rain this year. So hopefully no delays on that front. But overall, like you just have to avoid the water. You have to avoid the big numbers. I know it sounds super simple and rudimentary when you boil it down to that, but that's just the way that you have to do it. There's a reason that there's never been a back-to-back winner here. This course is full of such variance. It has a peat die design, so it's very short as well. For a par 72 to be under 7,200 yards or right around 7,200 yards is pretty unheard of on the PGA Tour, especially for a major venue like this. The water is what makes this so highly variable. So it's like this and PGA National are kind of the two where anyone can kind of win and where this course is so short yes distance is really going to help you especially in that eagle generation percentage just with easier second shots on the par fives but where this course is so short and a lot of even the bigger hitters end up laying up a la bryson in 2021 when he did that was it kind of brings the entire field into play and listen you see some very high-end winners here you don't really see a lot of jabronis come out and win the players championship because you can't go 72 holes without making a mistake or two and when you're not one of the top players in the world then you tend to just compound those mistakes when the pressure gets ratcheted up but you see a lot of just random players finish inside the top 10 who i mean this is like the doug gim open doug gim we're going to talk about because i'm really going to hammer down on recent form coming into this because when we take a look at some of the past champions that is really what we're looking at here so let's go over to fantasy national Dot com right now and take a look at the scorecard i've kind of went ever through everything already when we think about the most difficult holes there it is 18 14 8 and 5 uh three of those are par fours they all measure and even the fifth most difficult hole is a par four number seven they all measure between 450 and 500 yards number 15 is a par four that also plays well over par so it's all in that bucket of 450 to 500 and that long par three is in there as well and the 137 yard island hole uh, just because big numbers numbers can be made it has a you know, pretty decent birdie percentage almost 17 percent a lot of pars but this double or worse rate of eight percent we click on double or worse uh, it is the second highest after 18 so you can get it going bad that's where the cut sweats i mean this is really what the pga should be leaning into here is doing the cut sweat show for this tournament in particular because we have all the cams i might be able to cobble it together it's just i don't have the rights to actually show you what i'm watching at the time so tune in on friday for that because this is the tournament where you can watch every player on every hole every shot on the espn plus product it's going to be amazing i love it and the cut sweat for 17 18 is going to be terrific i mean it's never terrific because it just always screws you so so badly when you're sweating it but that's just how it kind of goes from time to time approach means so much at this course more so than almost any other course because i mean it works in conjunction with the water a lot of the time it's a lot like PJ National in that sense, where you see approach, you're like, oh my god, it's so high. Because if you put a ball into the water, your strokes gained approach is just going to absolutely plummet. So if we're talking about the top 10 finishers, or hell, even the top 5 finishers, where you see an even bigger gap, or even the winners when we get to that, that an even bigger gap between approach and anything else, that basically just means they didn't put the ball in the water, is what that tells me, knowing what this course is and seeing the numbers. So we take a look at some of the past winners, and how they've done in strokes gained approach. Scheffler was fourth last year, 7.6 strokes gained in approach. Cam Smith was fifth at 6.7. Thomas was fifth, 6.5. Rory, 6.5. Webb Simpson lost in approach. He was 92nd in the field. Everyone else besides Webb Simpson in 2018 and C, woo, Kim in 2017 have been top 10 in approach for that week on their way to victory. It's not like Siwoo was bad. He was plus 4.1. That was good for 16th in the field. And that year played exceptionally difficult. Got to score on the par fives. Like I said, tread your water and make sure you tread water on those longer par fours. Birdie the par fives, eagle the par fives. Do not give up the easy strokes there. You start going in the water on a par five, which is in play on all of them. And that's basically where you lose this tournament. So keep that in mind. Uh, I mean, there's no real way to predict that, but the great approaches from deeper down, or even some of the longer drivers that are more accurate. Like we saw John Rahm have a lot of success here. Rory has won this tournament. But again, no back-to-back winners, because it's hard to do year over year. You see the difficult holes. There's the five of them right there. 450 to 500 yards. The average shot distribution, very flat. I mean, the biggest bucket you're going to find in proximity is 200+. plus. That's only 
22%. I think at Bay Hill, it was 30%. Riviera was 30%. And it's pretty flat along the way. Like 125 to 150 is almost 20%. So the buckets of 125 to 200 plus are almost 20% flat across the board of what you're going to see on a lot of these holes. Hence, again, why you will see a lot of just weird players end up coming in. Uh, then you have this, you know, the 100 to 125 bucket. That's still 13%. 75 to 106%. Like, that's still higher than a lot of courses because there's not that many longer approaches. So the emphasis on keeping the ball dry I mean, with your irons, obviously, but just off the tee. Get yourself to wherever, and it's not going to be a super long approach shot. Uh, historic cut line here, it's been 144 players, and then you can see they adjusted the top 65 in ties a few years back, but it hasn't been under par since 2016. It's been plus three each of the past two years. That's, once again, where I think that number is going to come in. Plus two, plus three, plus four is a good guideline for an early cut sweat if you're looking at it and trying to think in your mind, like, hey, where is this going to be? Driving accuracy a little bit higher than we're used to at most courses, just by a, a fraction, green regulation percentage, way down. Uh, normally 66%, only 62% here. Scrambling, very difficult here because scrambling usually means you've hit it into the water uh, and you're probably not going to make par. Again, the three putts per round, slightly higher if you leave yourself with longer putts on not huge greens. They're not small greens, 5,500. Uh, but the driving distance is also way down at this course as well. 278 to the average driving distance of 280. Four. So again, guys taking driver out of the bag on some holes to increase their accuracy going forward. So let's check out what's going on in the players' field. I don't know what's going on in terms of the betting lines and the DraftKings pricing. It's not out as I'm doing this. On a Saturday evening, I was waiting for it to come out so we'd have some like real numbers to talk about. I don't know what they're waiting for. I've never seen this happen before where this has been a product of... It's usually on like Thursday. I can remember doing these shows. Like I, I usually had people lined up to do DraftKings pick shows on Friday for like a first look. Nothing, nothing this time around. So I don't know if there's something going on or they just, they don't want to get got in terms of what's going on in terms of pricing to create some soft pricing. Kind of like we had with Minwoo, which didn't end up turning out all that great, I suppose. But it was an egregious error. It just, Minwoo didn't keep up his end of the bargain at API when he came in at 6,600. There is a new tab on fantasynational.com, which I did did talk about. I really wanted this in here uh, based on the underdog drafts that I've been doing. The Pat Mayo Experience Listeners League now on underdog. Code Mayo at underdog to get yourself that $100 dollar bonus uh, for a first time depositor. If you really want to help out this show so we can do more stuff, on location stuff, all that, and you don't have an underdog account, please go sign up. That is what is fueling this show. That's why you're hearing me talk about it so much. And I've been doing the drafts with the viewers for the best ball league that's going on. And we have a tab on Fantasy National uh, at the bottom, the major season ADP. So we've added in a majors tab. So you can just look at Masters, PGA Championship, US Open, Open Championship. Because I mean, the Masters is one thing that's easy to go go find not necessarily stats for because the strokes gain stats are like proprietary to the masters but just strokes gain total stats to see who was just collectively played well there over time it's really easy just to go up and you know take a look at augusta national and click on it with the other ones where it's a rotation of courses every single year you then have to go like look at what the courses are go find them in the thing now you don't have to do that there's just a catch all for it so you can click on all four of them uh, that's what i've been doing for my best ball drafts i actually pu published my first article on twitter if you go to my account uh it'll show you all of the players that are in all of the majors you can also find that i had it in a handy list form but if you want to search players individually you can do that in the season-long planner at fantasy national in the top tab here if you're trying to game out who is in which field uh, you can do that by searching by players up on the end, Rory McIlroy. He's in. Listen, he's playing the Valero Texas Open. Who would have thunk he would be playing in the Valero Texas Open? But he's already committed. He's committed to the Scottish already as well, which I, I mean, I see the defending champion, so he's probably going to go. But I just thought that was kind of strange. So past twenty four rounds overall, we think about the modeling and how to really put this out. I'll show you what my player's model is, uh, and I think I'm going to deviate from it a little bit. So we go to manage models. I have my models for all of the courses. Is it under players? The players, all caps, because they're constantly shouting that at you. All right, let's activate that model and we'll click out. If it's not there, it, which it is not, just refresh the page and then it will pop back up. I like actually setting my pinned one here to strokes gain just so I can get a good glance at what's going on. But players championship, boom. I can show you what's in the model. 
right here, you know, approach opportunities gained, uh, which is birdie and eagle chances from inside of 20 feet, uh, fairways gain proximity from over 200 yards, putting, uh, five to 10 feet, 10 to 15 feet, uh, par fours, 350 to 400. The short ones, you want to capitalize on those more of an emphasis on 450 to 500, 10% of those birdies are better gained. And just overall strokes gained T to green. I have a feeling that the mixed condition model uh, is going to be more important for what I'm looking for this week. So I'm just going to leave it as is for this time around and see who actually rates out really well in the player's field. Let's see here. Strokes gained approach. What do we got? Uh, first in the field is Scotty Scheffler. Big surprise on that front. Hoagie is second. Hoagie kind of lit it up here last year. I, I think that people kind of forget about that. Uh, Fina was actually third, which shocks me looking at this the first time through. Xander Morikawa, Sebez. So... The big thing that I'm going to hammer down on when I'm making my picks here, uh, and I guess we can kind of get to it right now as I do it in conjunction with the model. Uh, And again, all this will be spelled out for you in the article when I put it out, along with those DraftKings numbers that I talked about, is what was the recent form of the winners coming into this? And unsurprisingly, more so than almost any tournament I can remember in recent history, all of the winners just, they were very obvious coming in. Um, and like we take a look at the course history, everyone has red everywhere. Um, no one is basically so let's go the guys who have gained the most strokes total at this course. Fleetwood, he had two top tens in 2019, 2018. He hasn't been inside the top 20 and got cut. Keegan, fifth to cut. Uh, Day and Rose finished inside the top 20 last year, cut the year before. A lot, a lot of red cuts for everyone. So there's no real like, oh yeah, well he consistently plays well. Paul Casey used to be the epitome of this. Now, here's a guy I really like. I'm going to bet on Russell Henley to win the Players' Championship, but more on that a little bit later. I, it's funny. He has the three cuts and the two top 20s, but I just like his form coming in. You see Doug Gim. Doug Gim is a top six here. He is a top 30 here, and he was cut last year. So just because someone has like two good appearances here, like someone like Victor Hovland, like he was in his three appearances at the Players' Championship, he's been cut and two top 10s. Does that mean he's going to win this year? I would say that based on the form a lot of these previous champions have had is no, he wouldn't because his form isn't good enough coming in. The last player with bad form to win at Sawgrass and win the Players' Championship was Siwoo in 2017. He WD'd and missed cuts, cluttering his early season results, although he did have a T22 in his lead up to the event. Like that was the only thing that he had flashed. And that's back when everything was in May. So this switch from May to March in 2019 when Rory won. So since it's switched to March, it's been like name brand winners. Rory, JT, Cam Smith, Scheffler. So just keep that in mind too. It doesn't mean the other guys can't win. This is the year of the other guys actually winning in terms of the PGA Tour. But that's interesting to note that the bigger names, fewer randos have just popped up. Although, you know, the years before that, Webb won at 80 to 1, Siwoo wins at 300 to 1. Jason Day was, I think, the favorite in 2016 going in. So Scheffler wins last year. What did Scheffler do going into this event a year ago? And this is important to note. I think it's important to note, and this is the way that I'm going to base a lot of my picks this week is the form sort of rankings coming in. So you see, this is actually the last time that he won a tournament. So coming into the players, he was fourth the week before at the API, 12th, 1st, 11th, 7th. That, and even going back before that, he was even better. But he had a win and a top 12 finish in every previous start before the Players' Championship. But what were his Players' Championships results the year before? If we look at course history, 55th and miscut in his career. So he had no good course history coming in. It didn't matter. So we go to 2022. Uh, most of these guys have left for live, weirdly enough. Cam Smith won that year. That was the weird three-day or two, two and a, or a day and a half delay. I think it finished on a Tuesday. Uh, that's how it ended up working out. But Smith was top 15 in four of the six previous events coming into that. So we can look up Cam Smith and do the due diligence on him. Actually, we can. what we can do to make things easier here is just go to 2022 because that will have everyone's data in it. There's Cam Smith. Yeah, Anurban Lahiri. That's when Paul Casey got stuck in the divot. Kisner, Keegan, uh, not necessarily the names. He, Cam Smith gained 11.5 strokes putting, and he was fourth in the field in approach. He lost five strokes on approach. That's how good his scrambling was. But that was a very difficult tournament. So you can see, what did he do? He had won the century 
earlier in that year. He was bad at the Genesis. He was bad at the Sony. Uh, at the RSM before that, he had been in fourth place. So you can see he had a win on the card previous in the year. That sounds pretty good to me. We're talking about someone's form coming in, uh, even if it is just a one-off. Uh, but even rolling back to his previous starts before that, like I had mentioned, you know, he had the fourth the RSM. He was 15th in Houston. He was 9th, 14th, like good coming in. He had one bad blip at the Sony, which he probably didn't want to play in after winning the century. He was only there, I believe, because he was the defending champion of that event. So that was his lead-in form in 2021 when Justin Thomas ended up emerging victorious. You can see Justin Thomas and Brian Harmon. Bryson was in second. Corey Connor, Shane Lowry. I mean, it's hard not to like Lowry again, especially what he's doing at API right now, just if we talk about recent form, how he's doing it. But Justin Thomas was top 15 in eight of his prior nine events coming into the Players' Championship, his previous two years before winning, 35th and 11th. Great. Rory wins in 2019. What were what was his lead-in form? He was top six in five straight events coming into it. His previous players' results, the two years previous, miscut in 35th. Nothing for him. And Webb, when he ran away with it, with Xander in second, Webb was top 21 in four straight coming in. He already had three top five finishes on the year so far entering the Players' Championship. He had been 16th and 66th coming in uh, at the Players' Championships over the years. So... That's why I'm I'm just really hammering down on this point that I think it's really less about what we're doing in terms of you know the predictive modeling. That is most definitely going to play a factor for me. You can see in the model rank that I have right now over the past 24 rounds, the best players in it. Scotty, Xander, Thomas, Ludwig, Morikawa. Ludwig's played some of these shorter courses really well. I was on him this week at API. I actually had a very nice Saturday in uh, with the easier pin placements. But I thought it was kind of funny. I mean, he has great form coming in. And he, watch him sneak out like another top 20 at API. And then when you look at his stuff, it's like, oh, yeah, he had four straight top 20s coming in. Obviously, he did really well. But look at some of these places where he's played well. Sanderson Farm, shorter-ish course. You know, he ends up coming second there. You have the RSM, the RSM, uh, the split courses down in the seaside. Those are short or those are short or coastal Bermuda courses in a similar part of the country. That's where he picks up his first win. Obviously, Sony, he comes 30th there. That's a short course at Wiley. Short course at Pebble Beach, he ends up coming in second. Short course at John Deere, he ends up coming in fourth. The biggest correlation course to this one is the Wyndham Championship. He comes inside the top 15 here. It wouldn't be out of the realm a uh, possibility that Ludwig actually just wins in his first start here uh, based on the form that he's showing coming in. Uh, you can see his approach is not great at uh, 20. I mean, it's, it's great because it's 21st in this field of 144. It's not like elite, elite. Everything else he's kind of doing is elite, elite in this sense. So these are, I mean, look at Doug Gim. Doug Gim ranks seventh overall. Like his form at the moment is fantastic. Fantastic. Gim has been fire. 16th, 8th, 12th, 13th in his past four starts. Like, that actually does check all the boxes of what I'm looking for here. A great iron player. He's fourth tee to green over that time. Dude sucks at putting, but, you know, sometimes that just happens. We're going to switch back over to the player's model here. I was just looking at my strokes gain model. And I have too many in here. So let's edit this model. Uh, let's take something out. Let's take out these short par fours. Uh, that's because I don't have anything weighted. Let's weight this. All right. So let's go... Approach and opportunities gain, they should be weighted around the same. I'll weight opportunities around fairways. That's about the same in terms of 200. And we'll see how the weightings all put themselves. I'll put 5 to 10 feet and 10 to 15 feet at the same. The shorter par 3, and, you know, I want the longer par 4s to be, you know, double-ish what the uh, shorter par 4s are like. Birdies are better gained. Since I have opportunities weighted pretty highly and putting weighted pretty highly, I'm just going to nudge that up, and I'll make tee to green pretty important here. Uh, I'll weight that at like 15 or so percent. Then we can update the model and see what we got going on. Yeah, so Scotty Morikawa uh, end up 1-2. Scotty Morikawa, Hovland, Xander, Finau, Hoagie. So Hoagie uh, is an interesting example. He's another one who just kind of, he almost set the course record here a year ago, finishing inside the top five. He just went nuclear. It's either on Saturday or Sunday. I can't remember the day right now, but his form is great. So he's sixth, so he's sixth 17th, 8th, 28th coming in. Uh, he's gained over seven strokes on approach at API through three rounds. He's, I think, top 20 coming in right now. He's just 
I think he might be dead last in the field in putting. He had been putting pretty well coming into this. You do see that around the green is more or less negated here. The year that Webb won, he actually putted a lot from off of the green. So if he can keep his driving in approach numbers, I you, I don't say you got to bet Tom Hoagie because the number might just be ass. I don't know what the numbers are. But if he is 75 to 1 or above, like hopefully you would get triple digits on him in a field like this. He was triple digits this week at API. This is a slightly stronger field, a bigger field. So I suppose his number will be influenced a little bit on what he does in the final round, if he does really well or really poorly. But he is he's going to be a bet for me. Yeah, I would probably guess he comes in at 90, 80, 90. And it depends on which book that you go to to bet any of this stuff. But third, I mean, he actually has never missed a cut at the players, which is kind of funny. The last two years, the putting has been atrocious. But this has been kind of a safe haven for guys who suck on the greens. And it just takes one week. The ball striking can just stay the same for Tom Hoagie. He might actually have a chance here. Aaron Rye, Lowry, Burns, Cantley, Burns is another one I think is a really good play coming in. I don't think that's like breaking news. And I was very discouraged by his number coming into this week at API. I I really didn't like it. Uh, It was 20 to 1 at open. I think it dropped down to like 28 by the time it closed because no one really wanted to bet on Sam Burns at 20 to 1 in that field. But if he opens at like 33 or 40, and a lot of it will probably depend on his Sunday. I think he's 5 under. Going into the final round, if he, like, shoots two over or something and he finishes T19, he's not going to get, like, a big boost up or anything like that. But just look at his form. His form is amazing. Sixth, tenth, third, tenth coming in here. And we're back in Florida where he does most of his damage. How has he done at the players? Not great, but... Again, that doesn't matter. What he has done well is putt really well on these greens. He he really has the Florida greens figured out. I mean, he's won the Valspar a bunch of times, and the Valspar has been reclassified too, like the Players' Championship in terms of greens, uh, as very much the same. They're now considered POA, not Bermuda, for this time of year at the Valspar Championship. That's been a change that's been made by the GSCAA, the groundskeepers. Listen, I'm no agronomist here. I don't really know what any of the shit means, but... It, it, it was very clear in the comment that they had made that these greens and the Valspar greens next week are going to be basically the same. And we know how well that he has putted on those greens over time. So then it's just like the rest of the jabronis that always kind of pop up here. Can't lay Rory. Watch Rory end up winning API after coming back. Uh, Pavon. Svensson, there's there's Gim. He's 15th in this model. EVR, obviously he has great form coming in. Connors, I really like his form coming in. Um, depending on his number, again, if I can catch him at another 80 like I bet him this week, I'd probably bet him again here. Uh, Ekro, Batia, Batia keeps killing me. Bez, Bez has the one bad start, but it feels like he's been playing some really good golf, right? So let's see what he's been doing. Eh, it's it's good, not great. So he had the second at the American Express. He has two missed cuts in there and then a bunch of top 30s. The approach has just been off the charts good. If he was hitting more fairways, which used to kind of be what saved him off the green, off the tee, because he has no distance to speak of, which is fine at this course. Don't really care about that, but... It would be nicer to see if he had been doing that at the moment. Uh, ben Ann and Adam Scott. Adam Scott's obviously won this. Stricker's in this field. I mean, Stricker can probably still ball at this point. He's playing great on the Champions Tour. Uh, but Ben Ann is someone who I want to say historically has played well here, but I feel like his 2020, his first round, he was up there. And then that got, yeah. He doesn't actually have any good finishes at this course. But uh, I had bet on him as first round leader. Uh, at the 2020 and he was in second I believe uh, before and Hideki was obviously leading but that was the point in time where they called it and COVID started so uh, they did not finish the, even the first round of that tournament Jagger was someone uh, let's, so let's dig into Jagger a little bit now if we can get Jagger at like 200 to 1 something like that he is someone with listen form for Steven Jagger I think is pretty good so far on the year because I talked about like even Cam Smith you saw like four of his past six four of his six events prior to his win at the players were inside the top 15. He had a win on the card. So it wasn't every event he was great, but he had these nice high finishes. And that's what we're seeing from Jagabombs here. And he was, I don't know where he finished uh, at Arnold Palmer. He was five under going into Saturday. No idea what he did on Saturday. It wasn't good enough to see him on the leaderboard, put it that way. But he might still be inside like the top 20 here. But he has a third in Mexico, third at the Farmers. He was top 20 at the Sony. He might end up with the top 20 at API. I think that would fit the criteria, really, of what we're looking for here, especially from a longer shot in this field. And as John had mentioned, I will look at the Wyndham stuff here in a second that he, he had 
the second lowest round to Tom Kim the day that Tom Kim went nuclear. We can actually kind of take a look at Steven Yeager to see how he's done at the Wyndham. Yeah, two top 15s the past two years, gaining on approach, making the putts on the green, driving the ball well. So that's probably what we can go and look at right now. So I'm going to put the model. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take this modeling, and I do want to stretch it out a little bit. So as we're building the mixed condition model, which is the model that I'm really going to trust this week, we're going to go to the rolling model. Uh, which is going to take a bunch of different things. Uh, I'll show you here in a second and put in my player's model that I had built. And this way I can still give it weight, but not all the weight that we need. So when I click on the rolling model, everything is weighted to 17%. What we need to do is weight this, weight the shorter term higher um, because that's what the information has told us. Uh, so we'll kind of go in descending order here. I do think last, I mean, past 24 is still pretty recent. So we'll go with 12 is the highest. 8 and 24 the same, and 4 the same. 4 probably shouldn't have that much of an impact here, but we'll put, weight it about the same as last 50, as you can see on the screen, and then last 100 the worst. So we'll update the model for that. We'll take a look at who actually comes out in the top here. Let's see here. Uh, model rank in this is Scotty, Xander, Fino, Nap, Rye. Really? Aaron Rye? Has he really been playing that well? Maybe he just doesn't have the rounds. I don't know. Uh, Ober. Oberg, Hoagie, Lowry. So Hoagie, Lowry. So we're just we're coming up with some names here. Hoagie, Connors, Jagger, Lowry, Burns. See, these, these are not picks that I normally would be making. So maybe this can lead me to the right way. Gim is another name that's up here. I'm not going to bet all these guys, of course, but these are the names that are kind of popping up. Ekrot. I, I could see it with Ekrot. Maybe not winning, but playing really well. Like, we're not only just trying to find the winner here. We're trying to find guys that pop up near the top. Connors, Cantlay, Hovland, there's Burns, there's Cam Young, Novak Nation. You want to talk about recent form. My guy here, Novak and Carson Young. This feels like it should be a good Carson Young course, just based on his skill set. Novak Nation, Paul Shaughnessy, leader of Novak Nation. Three top tens coming into this event. And he had a top ten in Mexico and lost three strokes putting. I don't know if he's ever played in the Players' Championship. Oh, he did. He played last year. It was absolutely god-awful. Um, I have no idea what this is all about and how he's doing this, but... Good form coming in. No one's going to use Novak. So you can maybe take your shot on that and hope to get lucky. Yeah, it's not really there for Carson Young. He has the two top 20s coming in. He had a top 10 at the worldwide from the back end of the field, like a top 40 play again on Carson Young at really long odds might be the way to go about it this time around. Uh, Glover, I mean, he just won at Wyndham, so that would be the the case for him. Wyndham Clark, you know, I like Wyndham Clark better on longer courses, although he just did technically, quote unquote, win Pebble Beach, and he might win the, I hope he wins API. I have a bet on him to win API. That'd be really nice. I could use the Mondays. Uh, that would be great too. So let's see. We'll look at Chris Kirk, and I do want to look at Russell Henley for a second. So Henley only ranks 68th, so we'll see how he's been doing. He's someone that I've been targeting a lot in the majors best ball drafts, uh, U.S. Open, PGA Championship, even the Masters. He actually has some decent run in his career. That, that's also the thing to look at. Like when I say, when I list off the names of a lot of these guys, Sheffler, Cam Smith, JT, Rory, Webb, Siwoo, Day, Ricky, these are all guys that play well with the Masters. Now, maybe it's just because they're good players. That could be the reason behind it. But I just thought that was interesting that uh, I don't know if there's any sort of correlation. I don't think that there is between these things, but... That was just interesting to me. So Chris Kirk got it back together a little bit at the Classic, uh, the Cognizant Classic. It's just called the Classic in the system right now. Very good ball striking numbers. This would kind of fit into what Chris Kirk does well. He has a win on the season. That is his only, he, has, he went win, top 20, and has two other top 30. So not the greatest form, but not terrible at the same time either. And to take a look at where he is currently at, he's T25 after three rounds at the Honor Arnold Palma Invitational. Where is Jaeger? Did he just shoot like 80 or something like that? Was he just fell off the face of the earth? Let's see here. Now, now that I'm in the system, we can find out what Jaeger is up to. Jaeger bombs. Uh, he's T25, which, I mean, would be a good finish for him uh, at an elevated event. Uh, but being plus four on Saturday is not helping matters whatsoever. Russell Henley's inside the top five. So we'll see how he has been doing this year. He had the fourth at the Sony. Corollary course. This is all part of, like, the Pete Dye rotation. Uh, and even before that, second at the Wyndham. Obviously, he's won Sony before. He's won at uh, PGA National 
before, of course, with a lot of variants. He went in the water a bunch, gained it all putty. But it was nice to see his putter actually turn around for once. He has a top 25, a top 5 so far this year. And going back to last year, he doesn't quite fit all the criteria that I'm looking for. But if you put a second place finish or a fifth place finish at API, then all of a sudden it's starting to look a little bit better. Then you can say he has three top 25s and two top fives so far this season. And then it kind of the narratively makes that case for what I'm looking for this week. So that, that's sort of the recent form guide that I wanted to go in. So I'll take this model and I'll add it to the mixed condition model. We'll call that the player's championship rolling model. So I need to get rid of all of the Bay Hill stuff that I have in my mixed condition model. Burp, 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 burp. It's gone. So right now we just have the player's model. We'll chuck that in right there. We'll update everything. That's the only thing that we have going in. So now we're going to go back to regular strokes game. And now here's where I really want to start piling on the form guide of what we're looking for. So we're just going to take recent form. And what do we call recent form? Well, I think 24 is probably the right number, but we'll throw in both. We'll throw in 12 and we'll throw in 24. And we'll just take strokes gain total. And that is a great way to quantify the results, even at the tournaments that don't necessarily have strokes gain. And we look on average, who are the best players over the past 12 rounds? Well, it's Scheffler, Knapp, Pavon, Novak, Zalatoris, Gim, Oberg, Burns. Uh, McNeely, is, McNeely is very interesting here. He loves playing at places with small greens. I didn't realize he'd been playing so well. Uh, terrible at the classic made the cut though. The off the tee game has been really good. Can you get this from him is what you really, we know we can light it up with the putter 13th in Mexico sixth. Okay. You have, you have my attention he gained seven point. He gained over seven strokes putting at this tournament last year and came in 60th. I, it, I do feel like his approach is just too bad. You would have to get really lucky on the approach week for him, but every other part of his game does make a lot of sense here. And I mean, he's coming back from a bad year. Clearly, he's showing something right now. So a back-end, like, DraftKings-type guy, top 40-type guy, if the number's right. But I was surprised to see him rate up this well in the very short-term modeling. Hoagie, Mitchell, EVR, Thomas, Chan Kim. So Puerto Rico and... API will obviously be added to these totals by the time Monday comes around to give you even more recent form. So I wouldn't just go with this. I'm going to load this into the modeling right now, add it to my mixed condition model, strokes gain total, boom, add it in there. And then I'll give it a, a bit of weight like that or something. And I'm going to want to put my model there. So we'll rate that a little bit higher than the uh, the overall model that I had built just for stats. This is a form guide. This is the very short-term guide that we're looking for. Uh, now what we can do is increase the sample size to the past 24 rounds. And if you ever encounter anything like that, you can just change up on the screen. So past 24 rounds, if we take an average, see if there's any sort of difference. Uh, so Thomas is actually the best player over the past 24. Xander, Ludwig, Pevon, Scheffler, Burns. So over the 12, Burns is a bit lower over the 24. He moves up a little bit. That's why I just wanted to grab double the sample size on that while still keeping it a little bit in the short term. So we'll call that strokes gain total. Boom, we'll chuck that one in. We'll weight that about the same as the past 12. We'll go back and rejig all the percentages here in a second. So with just three numbers going into it right now, um, we'll try to click on different courses. So there's two more filters that I want to throw in. One is going to be the aforementioned Wyndham Championship. So the reason I keep bringing up the Wyndham Championship, as you heard when I spoke with Rathouse, was just the amount of... Um, crossover winners that we've seen at this event and the, the play between those two places. Uh, so we're just going to go to Sedgefield uh, and look it up. Sedgefield CC, boom, apply course filters and see what we got going on here. Now, some guys just don't play this event. Like how many rounds does Scotty Scheffler have at? He has zero, he has zero rounds. So that's, you know, he'll end up with average weighting on this, which will hurt him a little bit. So maybe I won't weight this one really high, but I do want to take a look at the average. Past 24 rounds, who are the best players in this field at the Wyndham? Tom Kim, Webb Simpson, Victor, Sungjae, Sam Burns. That's good to know. Billy Horschel, Cam Davis, also good to know. I believe he was top 10 here last year. Henley, Ludwig, Eric Cole, Hoygaard, Taylor Moore, Ben Ann, Dietrich, Siwoo Kim. Okay, now we're getting some names. Matty Schmidt might win in Puerto Rico this week, so he's another name that popped up. Uh, Justin Rose, Alex Smalley, Morikawa, Will Zalatoris. So I don't want this to hurt the guys that don't play in those tournaments, which it's going to, inevitably, just thinking about it. So we, we can't rate it too, too highly. But what we can do is even like take a look at past 12 rounds. So let's take a look at the more recent years we've had uh, at 
this. I mean, you can even throw some of the other die courses into this as well. Like I, for the Sony Open, I usually do like Sony, Colonial, Sedgefield, and Heritage. Like those four kind of go all in the same bucket together. You could do that for this as well. But I'll just use the Pete die filter here in a minute. If I just take out, you know, 24 rounds and go to 12 rounds, uh, Tom Kim, Victor, Henley, Webb, Ben Ann, Horschel, Siwoo, Burns, Cam Davis, Ludwig, Eric Cole, Hoyger. So a lot of the same names. So we'll throw this one in. Call that strokes gain total at Sedgefield. Uh, you can see at Sedgefield. So we're going to weight this lower on the lower end of things. So right now, as we look at it, the percentages don't matter. But you can see that that is lower than uh, what we have for some of the other uh, weightings that we have in the mixed condition models. So we have these things in now. So who rate Scott? You know what? Even with that, Scotty still ranks out number one um, in the mixed condition model. The mixed condition model is uh, only the mixed conditions of what we put in. It has nothing to do with any of the filters that are on. It will always give you the same sort of number. So with everything in so far, our 10 best players are Scotty, Ludwig, Xander, Pavon, Burns, Knapp. He's probably not going to be helped out by his performance at Bay Hill. I'm not going to lie to you on that. Hoagie, Thomas, JT, Gim, Adam Scott. Then you got EVR, who's like some jabroni who's up here. Hadwin does pretty well, so does Ekrote. Horschel, is, is Horschel playing well? And I'm like not realizing it right now. He was good at APR at Honda, at like the back end, but 18th at Sony, 4th at the Wyndham. I guess if you go back and sort of take some of these other stats, and he starts to look a little bit better. I don't know if I necessarily trust Billy Ho at the moment close some of these tabs i have like 500 tabs open at the top of my screen you should probably close those as i go along uh novak novak nation 22nd in this ahead of ben ann just behind shane lowry again wait for the update on monday once we get all of the new information coming in so that's the Wyndham. so let's take Wyndham off for a second we can clear all our filters right here and now we're just going to look at pete die courses because this will include the players this, this will give more weighting to the good players who don't play those loser events uh, and go forward. You can probably add the Heritage. The Heritage might actually be a really good place to look at for this. A lot of similar skill sets. Pete Dye design. We've seen a lot of crossover success between those two courses as well. And that's been an elevated event over the past two years as well. And three of the past four years because it was coming out of COVID too. So three of the past four years, all of the best players have played at Harbor Town. That might actually be a good one to look at too to see who has played really well there in comparison to everywhere else uh but here's the pete die tab down in the bottom left boom pete die we're gonna look at the past 24 rounds on pete die courses uh just to give us enough of a sample uh but we don't want to go back too far so what i'm going to do with this is take 2024 2020 no that jumped on me 2023 and 2022 and apply my filters so just the past two-ish years or so because i don't want to have guys with stats from like 2016 that doesn't mean that doesn't mean anything to me i don't want that at all so best average per round in this i mean we can just take a look at the model rank uh this is for my strokes gain model by the way scotty comes out number one on pete die courses uh, and these are the pete die courses that it's drawing from uh stadium course at uh, pj west Harbor Town, River Highlands, Sawgrass. Those are the four that we're getting for this. Uh, you could add other courses into it, obviously, if you wanted. You could add, but we already have our own Wyndham one uh, to look at. So average on Pete Dye courses per uh, Jake Knapp in one round. Not great. Tom Whitney uh, is great in his one round at a Pete Dye course. Matty Schmidt uh, in three rounds. So who are some guys with some real samples here? Xander, I mean, Hideki fits everything that we just talked about. I wonder what his odds are going to be. I hope he kind of flails. Uh, then he can get his revenge. He can finally come through for a, for Cust at the Players' Championship, although Cust has already declared him the winner of the pandemic year because he was in the lead when it was called. But if he has another good finish this week with a quote-unquote back injury, he'll have a 13th a win and probably another top 10 or a top 5 coming into the week. Like, it's good form coming in. Uh, and as you can see, Total per round with eight rounds on Pete Dye courses, probably all from the Players' Championship, to tell you the truth. We can see what the rounds are if you click on the rounds. And it is Travelers and the Players. He must have missed time with an injury. That's exactly what it was at the Players the year before. Uh, anyway, that's where he's been at. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, elevated events for the Travelers as well would actually probably shed some more light on this. That one's not really the same as this one uh, in terms of how it ends up playing out. But again, another Pete Dye design with all of the top-end players being a signature event. But nice to see Hideki up there. There's Scotty Eckroat in seven rounds. Actually played these courses really well. Carson Young, 1.9 strokes per round over 11 rounds. 
pretty good. Kevin Yu. Minwoo. Cantley. Now we're getting some names. 4chan Kim. That's only three rounds. Bjelk in only two rounds. Uh, I can't believe Bronson Burgoon is in this field. That blows my mind. Keith Mitchell, very good at die courses. Hadwin, really good at die courses. I mean, Nick Dunlap did win at PGA West. Uh, Henley, really good at die courses. Spieth and Thomas. Uh, Ludwig only has the four rounds, but still very good. Connors and Rory. There's Ryan Fox. Uh, Harmon, very good at them. Sam Burns, I mean, very good being somewhat relative here. Like, we're down to, like, the 30 range of players ranked in the field. But these are all still players who are gaining... Right around, I mean, Sam Burns is getting 1.3 strokes on the field per round at Pete Dye courses. That's not nothing. Uh, Michael Kim, JT Poston. Poston is someone, based on his profile, should be... Uh, if there's ever a big tournament for JT Poston to win, he would win the Players' Championship. Um, and does he... Like, I mean, he has good form. If we went back, again, retroactively, and looked at his form, if he won this event, you'd be like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. He had a top 10 at Genesis, top 20 at Pebble. He's 11th the American Express. Back-to-back top 10s to start the year. But let's look at his players. So he has two T22s and a missed cut. So he shows that he can putt at this course. The approach has been ass. But if we go to the Heritage... You see, he has a third, an eighth, and a sixth. He's won the Wyndham Championship along with another top 20 and a top 10 last year. So it's been, these are the types of courses that he's plays well. RSM, Sony Open, he has, let's see, he had a top 10 this year. He was sixth place at the Sony Open. T21 the year before that. How has he done at Honda over the years? Not great. This one, That one has not been good to him. But there's enough of them around where you can see that uh, these are the sort of courses that he ends up playing really well. Uh, I'm not picking him to win again, but I am putting him on that short list of guys to consider even if he had a bad start because the form overall is still looking pretty good. So uh, I'm going to throw in the Pete Dye past 24 rounds and 2024, 23, and 22 in to here as well. And we'll just take a look at that and go with... Yeah, some sort of weighting higher than the Sedgefield one because it gives us more guys to actually go from. So now we're at 20% with that. So we have our overall stat model that we put in. Past 12 and 24 rounds just overall. Sedgefield, last 12 rounds, all Pete die courses. Past 24 rounds of people in the field. Scheffler remains at number one with Xander Burns now in third. Pavon and EVR have breached inside the top 10, as has Keith Mitchell. Doug Gim and Tom Hoagie and Hadwin are now 10 and 11. So Hadwin, he was a guy I bet on here last year. I actually won money on Hadwin. That was a few bucks I actually returned from the stupid tournament. And Hadwin was one of those guys uh, who rated out well. Is Pendrith in this field? He did qualify for this field. So he is someone that I want to look at now. Uh, we'll take a look at his overall player card. And I, I'm going to see if this is more perception or if this is reality, because sometimes we get these narratives in our head about players and what they do well. And I feel like the overall narrative with Taylor Pendrith, because he's you know one of the bigger drivers on the PGA Tour, that's what you think of is that he's going to do really well at Torrey Pines. He's going to do really well at Memorial. He's going to do well at all these courses, which require such distance off the tee. But in my mind, when I think back, because I had the same like initial thought about it, but my perception of him is he actually plays a lot better at the shorter courses. So let's see if that's actually true. Uh, Farmers, long course, top 10. Good. Sony, short course, top 10. Uh, Bermuda, short course, top 10. Shriners, I actually have no idea. Shriners in the middle somewhere. Uh, sort of an average course. He was third there. So he actually has a bunch of top. He either misses the cut or comes inside the top 10. Those are the two things that he's doing at the moment. Uh, Barbasol, longer course, played really well there. He had his injury. So let's go back. So he had a short course, top 10 at Pebble Beach. Uh, RSM's a bit shorter. T15 there. BMW Long played well there. Rocket Mortgage kind of in between was second. Players, top 15, short course. Honda, shorter course, T25. Farmers Long, maybe he's placed Torrey Pines really well. Bermuda again, shorter course. Maybe he just has courses, but he can... So it's not so much that he plays well at shorter courses versus longer courses. He does have a T13 at the Wyndham as well. He gained a ton of T in the green and lost it all on the greens. Uh, that was in his lead up to the President's Cup uh, that he was. I'm going to be at the President's Cup, by the way, this year. We just booked our lodging, getting tickets. Me, Tambo, Kenny, Cust, Feinberg, Paul. We've got the whole crew going. going to try to invite some more people as well. And I'm breaking this right now. We'll, we'll announce this on Monday with Feinberg. But me and Jeff are going to be in Vegas for Masters Weekend. We're going to be doing the show live from there. We're going to be doing a watch along at the stadium swim at the circa hotel if you're in town 
and you're in Vegas, want to come hang with Jeff and I and watch the third round of the Masters on that Saturday, you are more than welcome. I think we have a private cabana where we can all like hang, see you know, the pool is there, the giant screens are there. It's going to be an awesome time. And then I think the Paul and Cody are going to do a watch along for UFC 300 that night there as well. If you're just a big fan of Mayo Media Network going through. Let's go down to the length of the course. So under 7,200 yards and see who plays. Like this one teeters. It's 47% of the time, less than 72, 53% of the time over 7,200. But it'll end up being like 7,220, which I'm going to put in the bucket of 7,200. It's right around 7,200. So less than 7,200. Maybe we need to put in like 7,000 to 7,200 to get rid of those really short courses. But they're more. this course is more in the bucket of those ones. Because when we take a look at it, you can see the... If we click on par seven, I'm, I wonder outside of the players, what is less than 7,200 yards and is a par 72. I don't think that there's a lot of courses like that. Ben Ann has 24 rounds at said courses. Are they all the players? Uh, Pebble? Oh, yeah, Pebble Beach itself can fit into that because it's a par 72. The American Express, RSM, the Fortinet, American Express, Players Championship, Sanderson Farms. Okay, I, there is enough of that in there. Okay, good to know. Uh, so we'll take two stabs at this one. So we'll do the par 72 with the 7,200 yards. That will be one filter. We will add in, and again, we'll just do the average of strokes gain total. Patrick Cantlay, Jimmy Stanger, Hoagie. There's our guy, Hoagie. Bez, Bjork, Ryu. That's only in four rounds. Um, Scheffler, Pavon, Ludwig, Burns again. So Burns and Hoagie and Scheffler just are the names over and over and over that appear at the top of all of these lists. Eric Cole does do really well, too. Keith Mitchell is another one that continues to show up in a lot of these, and this is over the past 24 rounds. So we're going to add this one in, uh, and again, just call it strokes gain total. We're just looking. We're trying to find out form. That is the big... I never do this, and that's why I need to kind of switch up what I'm up to here. So we're going to do that one, and now we're going to take off par 72 and just do courses less than 7,200 yards just to see what that gives us. If it's the same, then there's no reason to put it in and see what it tries to tell us. Scheffler, Cole, Xander, Henley, Thomas, Cantley, Burns, Benny Ann, Ludwig, there's Rose. There's Wyndham Clark. Bez gets another boost. Poston is up there again. So we'll throw this one in as well, just because a lot of those guys have played well at this style, of course. And I think we're probably pretty good at this point. Like I said, I'm not putting in course history whatsoever. So that never has to factor in. Um, and we'll throw that here. So here's what we have cooked up right now. Uh, so the mixed condition model results are going to be the player's rolling model, 17%. Last 12 and 24, 18% each for stroke gain total. Stroke gain total of the last 12 rounds just at the Wyndham Championship, 6%. I'm going to boost that up to 8%, let's call it. Uh, Pete Dye, past 24 rounds over the past three years, 14%. Par 72 on courses less than 7,200 yards, 14%. And then last 24, less than 7,200 yards overall. No par in that. Uh, at 12%. So let's update the mixed condition model and see what our results are going to be. Ben Taylor, worst player in the field, uh, with Grayson Murray, who has a win this year, too. Good for him. Scotty Scheffler, Xander Shoffley, Sam Burns, 1, 2, 3. JT, Cantley, Ludwig, Keith Mitchell. So Keith Mitchell's our first, like, longer shot type of guy here. Hoagie is also inside the top 10. He's number 9. Hadwin is number 10. So those are three... Beyond 80 to 1, guys, right there. Uh, and probably $7,200, $7,100 on DraftKings. Uh, and even in the end of your, uh, if you do Players Championship best ball drafts, guys to take maybe at the later end, depending on how many people are, are in your draft. Just names that pop up. Paval is up there as well. Gim rates out 14th. Bez, 15th. Victor, EVR, Zalatoris. Henley's number 20. I love that. Just, I'm trying to find reasons to get on Henley. And now that the mixed condition is telling me he's a top 20 play, boom, might have to be in on that. Denny does really well. Don't like that. I hate Denny. Uh, JT Poston, number 24. Norin, Minwoo, Lowry. Lowry was a guy. So this is sort of the range that I was talking about earlier with the recent form type stuff. Uh, so you have like Lowry, Connors, Hideki, Carson Young, all in that mix inside the top 40. Grio, Sahith, McNeely, all in that top 45 range along with Tom Kim. I really wish Tom Kim was playing better golf right now. As you can see, like the approach numbers were bad at the classic, but going into it, like it wasn't terrible. It's just with Tesori on the bag, like it sounds like it should be a really good thing, but 
I don't know. Don't know how much I love that uh, coming in here. But yeah, that's going to do it on the Pat Mayo experience this week. We're not going to guess the odds because the odds are just going to be out on Sunday morning. They better be for this. And they're going to be very similar to what we just saw at the Arnold Palmer Invitational because it's basically the same very best players who will be rated at the top. And they're probably just going to copy and paste that going forward. Tony Fino is back in the field this week. That's really the only change except more jabronis at the back end. Again, just wait on Fantasy National to update on Monday once we get all of the Puerto Rico and API stats completely uploaded. We're at the mercy of ShotLink with all of this stuff, so we have to wait for them to send it and update all of their files. And as you've seen with Shot Tracker over time, not the most reliable people in the world. Don't want to take some shots at our partners here, but like, get it together, pals. Figure it out. FantasyNational.com slash Mayo will get you 20% off. And if you're watching this on, let's say, the 11th, I think the 11th or 12th, so the Tuesday or Wednesday this week, if you get the annual, uh, the monthly plan, sorry, at fantasynational.com, even if you get it today, if you get it on the 10th or 11th, yeah, if you get it Sunday or Monday, it works too, just when you're going to do your master's research. If you get the monthly plan right now, fantasynational.com slash mayo, you'll get all the master stuff and be able to build your lineups and do your research that way as well. That will be included in the month leading up because it's the month, the day to day. So the 10th to 10th, 11th to 11th, whatever day for the masters that you want to end doing all of your research and generating your lineups and using the ownership projections is the way to do that. I'll have more in-depth details in the newsletter this week on the Mayo Media Substack. Subscribe to that for free down in the description. Smash the like. Well, you're here. That always goes a long way in helping us. And if you're not on Underdog, get on Underdog right now, okay? Code Mayo, link is in the description once you have your username and make your first time deposit at Underdog Fantasy. Go fill out the survey that's in the description right now. I'm giving away five $1,000 Underdog credits away for the Players' Championship. The only way that you can do that is to do the survey, which takes 15 seconds. You need the Underdog name, then go do the survey, and boom, you're in the draw. I got Feinberg on Monday. I got the best bets on Tuesday with Ben Coley and the Model Maniac. That's going to be an awesome show. And then on Wednesday, Tampa's away on his 10th anniversary. So Ben Raza stepping up and in for the DraftKings show this week. And then Jeff, Tim, and I will be on the Cut Sweat show on Friday. Maybe even do a first-round recap on Thursday evening. A lot of fun stuff going on at the Pat Mayo Experience. So thanks for sticking with us today. I hope you profit at API, Puerto Rico, and then at the Players' Championship. Okay, I'm Pat Mayo. I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience! Experience!